I was a bit muddled in the head before that. I'd, I'd kind of gotten a clash from Brian Aban early on in the game, so I probably wasn't seeing clearly. If, if I had my wits about me, I don't know if I'd have taken on a 21 stone or 20 stone, six foot six, um, six foot seven, second row, taking a pop ball off a nine. House of Rugby Ireland, here on Joe, together with Guinness. Game changed. Hello and welcome to a very special episode of House of Rugby here on Joe together with Guinness. I'm Emer Constant and today I am delighted to be joined by Leinster, Ireland, Lions and working from home expert at this stage, Brian O'Driscoll. Brian, how is it all going with you? Yeah, all well, good. Thanks, Emer. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Are, are we all adjusting to this new life? I'm not entirely sure. I think you, uh, like everyone else, you, you know, still continue to be peak and trough days. But um, I don't know. I've enjo- I quite enjoy the, the house side of things and being, thankfully, I quite like my family. Um, yeah, thankfully. So, so, so it, do, it does help that, um, you know, we're, we're, kind of, we're really lucky that we, we moved into our house 18 months ago rather than, you know, being stuck. Um, in the last kind of six or, or eight months trying to get it finished off. So I think you're very thankful for lots of things um, considering what's going on in lots of other people's worlds. Absolutely. It really helps that you had people on hand like Vinnie Hammond though, to help you with your um, technical you are not setup wrong. in relation to that. You are not wrong. So when they put, when BT sent over the remote camera to put together, like I am the least tech person you've ever come across. There was life. just wires everywhere. I had three bags of, of gear and then, and, and, and so I was a bit conflicted or I was a bit um, constrained with how long it was going to, I had to put it together. I had like an hour and a half uh, to go and collect my daughter. And, um, and the next thing they go, okay. And my signal wasn't great. And then I, I he, you know, I was wanted to set up in the sitting room and the signal wasn't good enough there. So I had to go to my son's bedroom and literally there were wires everywhere. Um, but we got there. I actually almost got it operating myself. And then on Saturday morning, Vinny came over at eight o'clock um, to help me out just to make sure we got online. Well, look, it all worked out well anyway. And you got a good picture for the Instagram that everyone, no one would have known <laughs> you were under that pressure anyway. But um, just chatting about season three of House of Rugby, I have... Um, two men that you know very well. Um, I have Ian Madigan and I have Fergus McFadden as co-hosts on the show with me. Um, do I have to be worried about them or is there anything that I need to do in relation <laughs> to keep them on their toes for the, for the season ahead? I don't know what the right answer to this is. Should I, should I put your mind at rest and say, no, great guys, you're, you're grand, you're in, you're in safe hands? Or Three rugby players here trying to host the <laughs> show. <laughs> you know what, they, they will be great value. They'll be great value and you'll be able to really buzz off them and they will buzz off one another and it, you won't be shy of laughs your sides will be sore from laughing um, they're um, yeah they know each other very well and do you know what um, it's just I hope they know where to, where to leave things because it is it is a show that everyone's going to see and it's a family show so they can be bold the two of them but good value so I, I'm going to tune in I know you, usually it's, um, we're so well media trained, but you kind of lose yourself when you're with your friends mm. chatting away. So hopefully we'll get some good. That's where I get too. caught. That's where I get caught most is, you know, in a, in, you know, when I talk in on off the ball and you're in studio and you think you're sitting in your living room and you're, you know, be it Jer or, 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 or Joe Malloy, or I just chatting away. And when you say something that you think is a bit punchy and they don't give you any reaction, you're like, Oh, that's okay. And you just get enveloped into this web of trouble. And you're like, God, I need to get myself out of it. Yeah, you have to be mindful. Um, so if Fergus's golfing is anything to go by, am I to be worried or am I to be um, and, uh, anticipating the, the season ahead? Well, it's really his golfing attire more than actual <laughs> golfing. Like he, he golfs like he kicked goals, like 100%. Probably a bit more style in kicking his goals than, in, than his golf swing. But... Um, yeah, I, like literally it was the first week of retirement. of retirement and he arrived up to Milltown where I'm a member and I saw his get up. I was like, are you actually taking the mickey? I thought he was going for five side soccer. Like the socks tucked into the Fergus McFadden yeah. tracks and bottoms. Yeah, I thought he, he I literally fun. thought he was like trying to get me kicked out of the club. Um, so I hurried him quickly through to, um, well, we'll be playing the 14 hole competition over to the fifth and thankfully very few people saw him. 
um, but I couldn't help but take the mickey out of him on. No, it was brilliant. It was brilliant. Media, yeah. At least he has something to work on through retirement anyway. But we'll get back to, we'll, we'll, we'll get on to the rugby side of things. Um, sure. There's a, there's a, um, I suppose, ahead of the Six Nations, again, Six Nations at the weekend, um, I suppose someone that's missing is Sergio Parise in there. And I think that has probably caused quite a lot of us to, you know, wonder why he's not there, especially ahead of him announcing his retirement. But then he just said in an interview with BT prior to Friday's game that he plans on, you know, making a making an appearance in that 2021 Guinness Six Nations. So I suppose he's retiring. He isn't. He is. He isn't. Um, given the circumstances, had this been 2014 and you were due to retire, would you retire given the circumstances? And, That's a really and good question. Wedged? That's a really good question because... I understand from his perspective how he would want um, to be able to play one last time. And particularly when you've committed as much as he's committed to the Italian team and been captain for so long, um, um, that, you know, you deserve one last opportunity besides, you know, to get patted on the back himself for him to kind of thank the supporters for their enduring support of, of him. Um, so if those circumstances fell on me, would I be doing the same? I, I don't know is the honest answer. I, I, I'd, I'd probably be hopeful that I might just let it go because I, I, you can look in this a few ways. Yes, he deserves it, but does it, does it maybe feel as though he missed the boat in that regard? And, and unfortunately, you know, sport doesn't wait for anyone. Um, He's managed to have a conversation with Franco Smith that he's, you know, he's happy to include him in next year's Six Nations, and that's fine. Whereas, you know, you can look alternatively at that: is he denying somebody else that might feature in the 2023 World Cup a cap, uh, some a, 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 an 80 minutes of experience, you know, potentially? Um, and yeah, there's no, there's not much sentiment in sport anymore, and I think that's probably a good thing, but. You know, in this case, um, the rules have been broken and, uh, and he gets one last uh, final goodbye. It's hard to begrudge him that, but it's, it's suppose it's a bit unusual um, is probably the best way to put it. Yeah, it is. And I suppose like yourself, he's lucky that he can go out when he's choosing to go out and he's not going out forcefully due to an injury in that. So look, we never know. You never know what's going to happen if he will be back or whether he'll be selected or, or what will be the story in the future. Um, a few months back during the lockdown, we had Victor Matfield on the show. This, the, um, I'm sure you'll know him well. And he, uh, he mentioned the, the Lions tour in 2009 and the, the aggression and the intensity that came with that. So I suppose looking forward, way forward, there'll be a lot more conversations had about the Lions tour between now and then. But he mentioned that tour and that test, that especially the second game. And in particular, he mentioned that he was gunning to get you. He was out to get you in that game and made a point of saying it. Um, reminiscing and looking back on that game, did you know that was coming for you? Um, no, I, I didn't. I think it was, it, it was no doubt one of the most physical games that um, I think that probably the most physical test match I was ever involved in. It was really brutal, but one for the ages. Um, and so many people talk about Lions test matches in their memories and you see, you know, so often they choose that one, even though the Lions lost it in in um, in, in the dying moments. Um, people think quite like, the ferocity of it, and and they're right. It was really, really ferocious. But it was Test match rugby at its best. It was, it's why it was gladiatorial. I think that's why people love the sport is because it's there it was no hold barred. We just went at one another and. Um, and I didn't know that, um, <laughs> probably, probably better off not knowing I that he was he, running after me. I'd have been looking over my shoulder for 80 minutes, but... I think he mentioned something about you, an interview that sparked it. Obviously, the squad got together, heard that interview, and, and were gunning for you there. So, good thing you didn't. You didn't know that was, was coming for you. You know what? Sometimes, you, you know, I think you can look on things in lots of different ways. When you know that's happening, you know, you... Um, I don't, I don't know if it changes your psyche. I think you look forward and, and, and almost take on the challenge. Um, you m want to make sure that your footwork is good on days like that, that you don't get lined up, um, that you don't find yourself in a, in a vulnerable position. But these days, you know, and even going back 10 years, you know, there's so many camera angles. You know, there's, there's very little 
off the ball stuff that, that people get away with anymore, which is, yeah. which is right. But it doesn't mean that you can't physically impose yourself on, on an individual. Um, you know, exactly. if you get the opportunity to throw a shot at them, you know, you, you, and you did give it everything. That day. You did get that opportunity that day on Rousseau. Yeah. If we're still and, talking about yeah, that tackle. Well, I still, I, you know, I, I, I was a bit muddled in the head before that. I'd, I'd kind of gotten a clash from Brian Aban early on the game. So I probably wasn't seeing clearly if, if I had my wits about me, I don't know if I'd have taken on a 21 stone or 20 stone, six foot, six, um, six foot seven, second row, taking a pop ball off a nine. But yeah, it's one of those moments that, that kind of people go, oh, what were you thinking? I wasn't really thinking an awful lot. It was, it was one of those mo- situations where I, I, I had the opportunity to blindside him a little bit. And someone of my side needs that half second to be able to put in a, a decent shot against someone so physically imposing as, as the likes of Danny Rousseau. So it was one of the ones that um, stands out is because you, when you see a big man topple over, having a smaller man hit him, um, people kind of get a bit giddy. But I went off camera and had my own stumbles. Just the camera <laughs> you went over and had a little crying touch yourself <laughs> out before you could go back again. <laughs> and then I made an absolutely horrific read because my, my head was mangled on Brian yeah. Aban and he scored a try and then I went off the pitch because you know as and rightly so that's you know yeah you, you weren't the only one that day I think there was there was four or five of you that went off through mm. injury and through head injuries at the time and probably a lot more that were undiagnosed as you said at the time um so it was definitely a challenge and I'm sure one that the Lions are really excited for especially going up against the World Cup champions next year yeah and it's the it's the third time um you know, in succession that the Lions Tour is going to South Africa with them as world champions, as World Cup winners. Um, so it adds an extra um, bite to things. Um, you know, where South Africa have come from in the last two years is pretty amazing. You know, they lost to, to Ireland in, in Dublin by a record score three years before the, the, their World Cup success. So to have turned things around and the manner in which they did it, um, you know, it's it's historically a very difficult place to go and win, and uh, and that'll be no different this time round. It'll be a good Lions squad if if you know, if they get to pick from close to a full deck, but they'll still have their work cut out against you know one of the most physical sides in the world. So yeah, I, I think we all loved watching Lions tours, and and South Africa for me is the best is the best tour, um, and it's it's largely to do with the the actual times of games to be honest with you as a player to be able to go and play in the middle of the afternoon and then still hang out with your teammates later on that night you know be it go for a beer or a coffee whereas in New Zealand Australia you play your game late at night and those that don't play go back off and go to bed for training the next day so you don't get to hang out and see one another and kind of knit as a unit so I think South Africa lends itself towards being a more unified team. Yeah that's great that's that's really interesting to hear as someone looking from the outside in you don't know those kind of things, but it's, I suppose, yeah, it's all down to TV and, and the timings. But mm. I suppose, personally, as a women's player at the moment, ahead of our Six Nations game against Italy, um, Canterbury and IRFU and Elveries this morning just announced the women's jersey and it looks phenomenal. The girls, like mm. Junior, our captain, Darrow, um, Larissa, they're all looking really great. And I suppose rightly so, the Canterbury rectified the mistakes that they made during the summer and, and openly spoke about it. But... Guinness have come on board and are on board for this really exciting partnership to promote it and to launch and to, I suppose, promote the women's game and the the, the jersey launch as well. Yeah, no, they like obviously it's 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 about time that the women's game has um, has seen some promotion. I think in women's sport in general, um, it's you know there's been. <clears throat> nothing close to parity with the coverage, um, but yet the participation levels have been incredible in women's rugby in particular across the world. It's one of the fastest growing s- sports in, 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 in women's games. So um, it's brilliant that Guinness have come on board. Um, and I just looked online just before we were talking and um, saw the IRFU pictures and, and the jersey looks class. And it's important... You know, I, I'm involved in um, doing a 20 by 20 talk in a couple of days' time. And it was triggered on the back of, of a tweet that I sent a few weeks ago just because 
it, it, I think it's women are, are promoting, are, are pushing the, the rock downhill with, you know, preaching to the converted to other women. I think the responsibility lies with men to promote it. And, and it's frustrating because, of course, there's kickback from other men that don't want to change the status quo, that like the idea of, you know, of media coverage being, you know, male centric. But, you know, as a father of a daughter and who knows, maybe another daughter um, in a few months time, um, it's important that they have visibility role models, that they have aspirational individuals to look up to and for that visibility to actually be a thing. Why would, you know, why would 20 by 20 be, um, you know, be a moment in time and then be lost thereafter? You have to, we have to, as a, as a male race, I think, um, as, as a male gender, pick up where the women have started and promote it because we're fathers of daughters and do we want more for our sons than we do want for our daughters? Nonsense. I want them to be able to aspire to being some of, you know, the great role models yourself, Sene you know, um, Claire Malloy, all these girls that have done brilliant things for the Irish uh, women's rugby team, um, or if they want to be the next Leona Maguire, or they ne want to be the next Stephanie Roach or Katie Taylor, we've got to promote women's sport and have it visible for them to aspire to be the, the, those, that next generation of great sports women. I do. I think that is so powerful and such a powerful message that you said that. And I think it's interesting that, you know, the women themselves promote themselves quite a bit and they have to really fight for that promotion. Whereas having people like you on board, um, it's really powerful for the women's game and, and it can only go up and up. And 2020 campaign has been phenomenal and the response they've got has been phenomenal. But I, I even what's in Paul O'Connell was on the Late Late Show and he chatted about how having a daughter has changed his mindset. And you, you're chatting about the same thing that... I suppose it's just equal opportunities and giving them the same. Do you know what, Emer? We, we as, as men never really understood the differences because we didn't have to worry about it because we were getting the upside to it. And all the small things that have become apparent, and I did a, did a bit of research before going on my talk on, on Wednesday, and to understand how, like, I know it's a long time ago, my, my wife was telling me they didn't have a half day on a Wednesday to play sport is it just wasn't a thing. And I know that's gone a long time, but that's what you're dealing with initially, you know, straight off the bat. Um, you know, lots of situations where I've heard of, you know, girls games being uh, in co-ed schools, being called up a couple of minutes early so the, the boys can get out onto the park and, and warm up beforehand. Or where there's two pitches and there's a girls and a boys game, the boys get precincts on the, on the better pitch like that's outrageous in the in the world that we now live in and that has to change and the only people that will change it you know it you know it will be the will be men and and i talk about the kickback i had someone really annoyingly and and i almost wanted a name and shame but i wouldn't i, I don't do that um but talking I, I promoted i took a picture of jackie hurley's book girls can uh, girls play too and, I, and we've been i've been reading it with my daughters and and then we've been taking, or my daughter, and, and taking tests as to can she remember all the individuals. She's a bit better than my son at that at the moment. Um, but, um, you know, but then someone makes a comment, oh, I see the, you know, the feminazis have gotten hold of you. It's like, it's just, it, we got to break this cycle. And until more people talk about it and more t people try and promote it, and, and the reality is it's probably going to be fathers of daughters. Shane Lowry did it in, 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 um, the Irish Open, where he wore the 20 by 20. And, and we want the best for all of our children, irrespective of what sex they are. And, um, and, and, and that's the next tranche of how we promote this, this game. It's not through women, because as I said, you're preaching to the converted anyway. Absolutely. And your support is greatly appreciated. And more like you, what is, are what is needed in the women's game. Well, Brian, it has been a pleasure to chat to you and have you on today. Um, I'm Emer Constein and I am with joe.ie here on House of Rugby together with Guinness. House of Rugby Ireland, here on Joe, together with Guinness. Game change.